now. The first one is Chris Nylon. Chris is uh, Vice Chair of Stop the War. He uh, has been part of founding the movement. He's probably the person who's organised more demonstrations than probably most of us, the rest of us in the room put together. Um, and he has been a, a very, very strong voice. He's also written a book uh, earlier this year about February the 15th and 10th anniversary. Uh, which is available outside if you if you want to get it. And he's going to talk about the NATO summit and how we build the movement internationally over the next year. So please, warm welcome for Chris Lyman. Thank you very much. Um, we talked uh, about two aspects of uh, recent events at this conference, which is slightly contradictory. Uh, one is that the uh, campaign to stop the uh, attack on Syria was a vindication of protest and a vindication of the power of uh, public opinion, a much needed vindication, a situation where uh, protest past and present came together uh, finally to shape the future in a way that was, uh, that was very, very empowering. And we shouldn't underestimate the impact that's had, as, as a number of speakers have said, the peace process that is at least beginning the glimmer of some sort of hope uh, in, over the question of Syria and Iran is a product not, as the media are suggesting, of Obama's brilliance as a peace president. In fact, far from it. The opening to that peace process only came the moment Obama was actually stopped from trying to launch another war in the Middle East. But the, the, the other aspect of, of, of the recent past is that uh, the fact that they did indeed try to go to war over Syria, although they're sort of trying to bury that fact now. Um, this is a sign, unfortunately, of the continued aggression of the Western powers, not just the US, but Britain and France were at the forefront of trying to promote this attack, just as they were at the forefront of trying to of successfully launching the attack on Libya. And so it is a warning for the future. We've talked about the, uh, the reasons for the US's continued aggression, the challenge from China and the new regime in Russia, uh, 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 a kind of challenge to the um, unipolar dream that the, uh, the US continues, uh, continues to harbour. But I just want to think about Britain just for a second, because the bad news is that I think uh, Cameron's behaviour shows that for all that Tony Blair was a war addicted, me a war addicted uh, megalomaniac, he wasn't an aberration. And today's ruling class in Britain, today's establishment, is very, very keen on war. In fact, it's, it's part of a policy, in my view. Britain has the fourth biggest military. Uh, it has the second biggest uh, arms exports around the world. And I think the British establishment over the last uh, a couple of decades have looked at the sad state of British capitalism and decided that there's two things they do well. One is financial services and the other is foreign wars. And that's what they've gone with. It's a kind of banks and tanks strategy um, in, the, in the twilight world of the British establishment. And of course, it's in that context that we have to understand the continued uh, uh, alliance, the so-called special, uh, special relationship, which is more like a kind of serial humiliation. But this is why, for all their failure over, over Syria, which was a body blow to the whole project, we still have a big struggle on our hands. And I want to just mention a few of the campaign um, priorities that I think are coming up in the next, in the next year. And I, I very much welcome Manik Mukherjee's um, uh, invitation to us in the, the movement in Britain to widen our alliances and to try and forge uh, as many uh, uh, international links as we possibly can in this fight. because. Despite the rhetoric once again, what is happening is that the war on terror, far from being ended, is actually spreading to new areas of the globe. And that means that we have to uh, uh, extend our alliances, think strategically about the kind of uh, alliances we can make and the kind of uh, resistance that we need to organise. Of course, there's the question of drones. I think what well, there's a conference coming up in Berlin in a, in a couple of weeks' time. We want to go to that conference. I'm sure it won't be controversial and suggest 
a, 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 a worldwide day of action against drones where we can coordinate right across the international movement. There's a question of Chilcot that was raised uh, by Peter Brali earlier in the day that the absolutely outrageous cover-up that is now being exposed. We're going to be campaigning over that next year uh, as well. But I just want to mention finally three other points because their obsession with militarism in Britain, our government, is so great that it, that it runs so deep that it's become kind of retrospective. They're going to spend a good deal, unbelievably, of next year, the 100th anniversary of World War I. They're going to spend a good deal of time, energy and funds trying to rewrite the history of that war just in case it might put people off future slaughters. In fact, their claim is that that history has been hijacked by poets and playwrights who they apparently regard as being dangerously oversensitive to suffering. And that's actually the culture minister speaking. I, I am actually serious. Um, Maria Miller, who is the culture minister, is on record as saying it was important that there was a war that ensured that Europe could continue to be a set of countries which were strong and could be working together rather than in any other way. But apart from the grammar, there's a kind of historical ignorance considering what happened next uh, about that quote. But the truth is, this millionaire's government and their hangers-on are in fact themselves trying to hijack the memory of the 600,000 British soldiers who died and the many more who were wounded and play down the appalling figure of the 16 million people who were killed in that slaughter in an attempt to clear a way for future wars. And I believe one of the things we have to do next year is to celebrate the poets, celebrate the playwrights, celebrate the pacifists and the socialists and all those who oppose one of the most senseless slaughters in history. Well, Cameron, as has been mentioned, is hosting the NATO conference uh, in Newport in Wales. And unfortunately, some politicians have been uh, welcoming the event as a boost for jobs and tourism, which is about the level of the mainstream discussion on these matters. Fantastic, NATO's coming to plot further wars. That will put Gwent on the map, put the bunting out. Um, this is a travesty. NATO. Uh, far from being some sort of mutual security organisation, is and has been from the start a kind of straitjacket to keep Europe inside the asylum of US foreign policy. It's uh, a mechanism for trying to tie the West, the whole of the West, to a US aggression around the world. And we will be calling protests and counter conferences uh, it, it, from the beginning of, 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 of next year because we want to ensure that there will be, and I think this conference should announce that there will be a welcoming party for NATO delegates, but it will be one that represents the real opinion of the majority of people, not just in this country and around the world, that we want to end these foreign wars and we should break the special relationship. Just, just finally, one other, one other point I want to make, slightly more general point, which is that I know that many people in this room and people involved in the anti-war movement and the peace movement here and elsewhere are also campaigning on other fronts, and many people will rightly be involved in the campaign about, against the vicious austerity being pursued by this government and others uh, uh, around Europe and beyond. But I want to say this, that you can't have a serious and effective campaign against austerity without taking on the question of the wars. Partly this is because the scale of war ex expenditure is in itself a great argument against the inevitability of cuts and austerity. But more important, our ruling class is very, very good uh, at using wars, uh, not just to extend their power and influence and support the corporations abroad, but also to spread nationalism, militarism, racism at home. And one of the things they've done is to demonise the Muslim community in this country in the most dangerous way. And partly as well, of course, this has a knock-on effect in, in creating a poisonous atmosphere over immigration in general. And we have to oppose this root and branch. And fighting against the wars is a crucial part of this campaign. And I believe, I guess that really we all want to break austerity. We probably, most of us, want to break the government in this country, but we can't do either. We can't break the government, we can't break its austerity without smashing its foreign policy and ending their devastating wars. Thanks very much.